It's always a trip. I'm, I'm a little bit booby. Seems to be hitting me. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, oh, there's a race. There's a race. It's always a privilege uh, to be able to um, have a time of dedication. And uh, it's a, a real joy and privilege to have uh, Daniel, Gabriel, Omar, and Yasmin. And I hope I've pronounced all those correctly. If I haven't. And it's, it's, it's been a joy to have them worshipping with us uh, for some months now. Yeah. Not quite sure how long. And uh, it's, it's nice that they feel welcome as they're obviously uh, a long way from home, uh, which is Romania. And so we're glad to, that you're here and uh, we're glad to have the privilege this morning of having this dedica time of dedication uh, for you uh, and we ask you. So if you'd like to come to the front, please. And Brian, you can join me as well. Jesus. 
Do you commit yourselves to bring her up in an atmosphere that honors God and our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you promise to seek the help of the Lord Jesus as you bring up Yasmin within your loving heart? Brilliant.
the throat of a whale is very small, although it's got a massive mass, the throat is too small to swallow something the size of a man. So the little girl simply said, well, uh, when I get to heaven, I'll ask him how it happened. And the teacher said, well, he may not be in heaven. He might be in hell. So the little girl quickly replied, well, you ask him then. <laughs> I also thought that was quite funny. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> Just to remind you that uh, December Bible readings are available if you have the hard copy. But what I'm going to do today is to continue with our series on the basic teaching for Christians. And uh, so far we've looked at fortune telling, tarot cards, horoscopes, science, science, yeah, sciences, that's right, thank you. Isn't it funny, it was, I knew what it was in my mind, but I just couldn't get it out of my mouth. Spiritism and the occult. And as we start today, what I want to do is to again assert that our understanding of all these things is formulated and based on what God has said. And I also want to emphasize these words of Scripture that we read in Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 5 to 6, which simply says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will direct your paths. What a fantastic scripture that is. Now what we're going to look at this morning is chain letters. And you might say to me, well, I'm not involved in chain letters. That is great. Uh, but hopefully this time this morning will help you bring any answers to those who are involved. I know a little while ago I did actually do some teaching on the subject of chain letters and stated really that they have no place within the life of the followers of Jesus. Now with the coming of social media such as Facebook and Twitter and other things, chain letters have taken on a new form. And you may not have realized that actually they have become a part of social media. Media. They used to take the form, and still do to some degree, that somebody would send a letter to, to somebody else. Hands up who's ever received a chain letter. Yeah? yeah? So you know the, the, basically what goes on. You, you receive this letter. And it's a letter that promises you wealth, health and good fortune. However, in order to receive that, you have to pass this on to around about 10 other people. However, the letter also contained in it a threat. And the threat is that if the receiver does not forward the letter to 10 other people, then they would receive bad fortune in some form or another. And the sad thing is that many people, you know, we put our hands up, get sucked in by it. Particularly when we're younger. And as I say, this has spread to social media and emails as well, in a similar manner. But of course it's not always as clear as what I've just quoted in the examples above. Quite often a post is put on social media and you know those of you who are on uh, Facebook and Twitter you'll have seen these things asking other people to either share what they're putting on or 
post it to others with the comment, and this is a barbed comment, I know that most people won't do this. What an awful thing to actually do and say. And the inference is, you see, is that if you don't share it, if you don't repost it, then you are not their true friend. Mm. Oh. <laughs> there was one on last night, um, I can't remember what it was, but it was quite awful. It was of a kind of spiritual nature that said that if you didn't share this, then you weren't a friend of Jesus. And when anybody else saw that, you might have seen it. And that's a terrible thing to say and to do. Because those kind of posts do infer that not to share it means you don't actually care about the person. Or about what they're writing about. So why is this not living in the ways of Jesus? Well, there are many reasons. But one reason is that it is an attempt to manipulate the feelings of other people. So when you receive one, when you receive one of these emails, or when you receive or, or, or get it on Facebook or Twitter, it's an attempt to manipulate you and to manipulate your feelings. It's also an attempt, or can be an attempt, to bolster the person that's posting it to bolster their own self-importance or their own ego. It's also sending the receiver of the post onto a guilt trip. And that's not good. You see, what does it make the receiver think? It makes them think, what will they think of me if I don't respond? The basis of these chain letters is to deceive who the person is receiving. That's what it's all about. It is to deceive them and it is to bring them into fear as well. If I don't. And this runs against the truth that it is only Jesus who sets us free. I want to read this scripture to you which comes from John chapter 8 verse 44. And John's talking to the Jews and the Jewish leaders and he says this pretty strong stuff you are the children of your father the devil and you want to follow your father's desires it's a wonder he got away from that crowd with his life from the very beginning he was a murderer and has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he's only doing what is natural to him. Because he is a liar and the father of all lies. Now since chain letters are in themselves a lie, since much of the stuff that's put on social media is a lie, and is designed to bring you into fear, we can see that all these things actually come from the devil. Now that might seem quite strong, a strong thing to say, but I believe it to be true. Because it is designed to bring you into fear and into anxiety. It's a lie. And the fear, of course, is just a to so say it's completely different from the fear that we talk about when we talk about the fear of the Lord, which is awe and reverence. This is also what God's Word says to us. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. So then, love has not been made perfect in anyone who is afraid, because fear has to do with punishment. And chain letters, in whatever fashion, seek to divert people away from their reliance on God 
into trusting in some other power. And that's what chain letters do. They are a diversion, they are a lie to deceive. And that's a form of idolatry. I don't know whether you realize that. It is idolatry. And therefore it's also contrary to what God says in his word. It is the very first commandment, which is what? It is this, that you must have, you must have no other God but me. That's pretty plain. Believe it or not, there are even supposedly Christian chain letters. Supposedly. But they can't be Christian because they operate in the arena of fear. They are contrary to the Christian way of life. Why? Because they are actually founded on, founded on a person doing something, passing it on to receive a blessing. That's not the way God operates. God operates in grace. God's Word tells us thus, this. It is better to trust in the Lord than to depend on people. And the next verse says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to depend on princes. And you'll find that in Psalm 118. The reliance of you and me as, as born again people is on our Lord Jesus to meet our needs, not on some chain letter. What is Jesus, what is the word of God says? It says this, and with all his abundant wealth through Christ Jesus, my God will supply all your needs. Not a chain letter or anything else like that. Chain letters reject our reliance on Jesus. Chain letters are based on people being afraid that if they do not respond, they will encounter bad fortune, ill health, or some other disaster. But fundamental, fundamental to the life of the Christian, of you and I, is the fact that God wants to bless us. And of course he blessed us when he sent Jesus into the world. And he continues to bless us as we've sung this morning with his presence within us. Wow. Chain letters are a diversion and a distraction from the grace of God. And Jesus tells us this. He said that he came to give us life. A life in all its abundance. I've used the old fashioned word there. All its fullness. Therefore, it is for you and I as Christians to reject all chain letters. To destroy them. To consign them to junk men. Or to blocked men. Social media is also used, as we've said, to invite people to share something. <coughs> For instance, there may be a person, you've seen them, on social media, which states something and then says, click to share, if you agree. Or whether I agree or whether I don't agree, I'm not going to click. So if you're in the habit of sending emails like that, or social media, Facebook, things like that to me, I ain't going to respond by clicking. Sometimes they will put on it, post this on your home page to show that you care. Well, I'm not going to say any more about that. It may appear that there's nothing wrong with it, but it is an ungodly pressure that is placed upon people. And it is an invitation to probably get involved in something that is anti-Christian. And it is often an attempt to send us on a guilt trip. If you've ever been involved in anything like this, or are involved, now I believe the time is right to repent of it. I believe that now is the time to affirm your faith in God and in our Lord Jesus, who alone provides us with life 
and all that is necessary for living. This is what God's word says in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Chapter 1 verse 3. His divine power. I think these are wonderful words. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and for godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Fantastic, isn't it? You've got everything you need. You don't need chain letters or anything else or social media pressures or whatever. So, if you've been involved, get before God and repent of it. Now for something completely different. White lies. Well, let's start with what God's Word tells us. And this might come as a shock to you. The Word of God says this in Psalm 116, verse 11. All men, that's mankind, ladies, includes you, all are liars. It was shocking. Isn't it? You're a liar. I'm a liar. How many times has, this isn't down here? How many times has somebody said to you, "How are you?" and you said, "Oh, I'm fine," and you're not? It's a lie. You might think, "Well, they don't really want to know about my problems." That's irrelevant. What you think? They've asked you a question. Give an honest answer. I do it. You do. We're all liars. However, I suppose the truth of the matter is that we all like to think and consider ourselves to be honest and true. We like to think that we're people of integrity. Yet God's word is very clear. All are liars. I could probably be pretty certain to say that this isn't preached very often in churches. But when you're dealing with things, you have to deal with them. And the psalmist in this particular psalm was referring to the falsehood of mankind to be able to provide answers to the questions that he had. And whatever answers people gave to him, they were false. And if something's false, it's a lie. Job found this to be true. You remember Job, he had this, uh, terrible, these terrible afflictions that Satan brought upon him. And three friends come and visit him. And they try to comfort him. But every comfort they brought to him was useless. It was false. It was a lie. And God had words with them about it. You see, mankind is unable to provide the answers for life. Mankind is unable to provide us with salvation. All the philosophies, all the ideologies of the world are false because they lead people away from the truth. And the truth is Jesus. Now, I guess people generally perceive that there are two types of lies. One, a serious lie that is meant to deceive others and to lead them away from discovering the truth. So we're not going to deal with that because most people would accept, yeah, that's not right. But then there are less serious lies which are usually seen as the white lies. And they're seen as being harmless. Such as preventing someone from getting hurt if they were to know the truth. And it's, it's strange how things change. When I was a youngster in my teens and twenties, um, if somebody was terminally ill, they weren't told. Or well, you don't tell them. It was withheld information. And so the family had the terrible task and time of actually being with their loved one, but there was this barrier because it wasn't mentioned. These days, of course, it's completely different. 
and much more open and, and actually much more honest. So it is strange how things change. What was considered possibly a white lie years ago in order to you know, ease things didn't do it at all. It just created terrible tensions between those who were dying and those who loved them. As I've said, most people would agree that a serious lie is not acceptable. Whereas the second type, the white lie, is acceptable to most people because the object is to bring about help and goodness. It follows the thought that, well, actually the end justifies the means. That's a very dangerous line to go down. And a serious question has to be asked. How is it that something that is bad, which a white lie is, how is it that something that is bad can actually produce something that is good? Well, let's read what Jesus has to say in Matthew 7, verses 16 to 18. And he's talking about his disciples and all the followers of Jesus. But it, the, the, the illustration that he's using actually fits the bill. He says this, You will know them by what they do. And this is the point. Thorn bushes do not bear grapes. Mind you, there's a gooseberry bush that has thorns on it, doesn't it? That's beside the point. And briars do not bear figs. And here's the point. A healthy tree bears good fruit. But a poor tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a poor tree cannot bear good fruit. You see the point? Since a white lie comes from the same tree as a serious lie, it is impossible to see white lies as being good or beneficial. Now you may disagree with me on this, I'm just bringing you what the word says. Really. Whatever benefit may appear to come from telling people a white lie will eventually be unraveled as a deception. And what is a deception? It's a lie. On this understanding, no kind of lying can be seen as being good, as honouring our Lord Jesus. What are white lies? Well, I've just got a few down here, um, and you might think of a lot more. There are many forms of white lies, such as lying to prevent someone from getting hurt. Well, as we see, this is all based on the belief, actually, that the truth can be harmful. Really? I guess it really depends on how sensitively the truth is told. And that is key. Probably come back to that in a moment. Secondly, a white lie is often told to make ourselves appear, to appear better than what we really are. This might include boasting. Have you ever thought of boasting as lying? Well, to boast is a lie because it's actually saying something that's not true. And embellishing the truth about ourselves. This is why I detest those times when people say, I know you've just been through one, I'm glad I wasn't here. Write down your weaknesses and strengths. You might like that sort of thing, I don't. I'm not saying that's lying, but it can lead to that because it can lead to an embellishing what your strengths are. Saying more than what you can really do. You've probably heard it, I've heard it, you've probably said it, I've probably said it as well. But it is kind of my line. They're also told to help someone out of an awkward situation. Such as a boss expecting his secretary to say he's out of the office when he isn't. It's a white line. It's 
It's not the truth. Exaggeration. Oh dear, that's getting a bit close to home for all of us. Exaggeration is also a form of white lying. And it's something that we're all given to at various times. For example, I've said it, you might have said it, stood at a junction, waiting to pull out, and there's millions of cars. Obviously a false statement, a white light. There are not a million cars coming, but it is a lie. And you can think of other things. It's said, obviously, to emphasize the length of the queue as you're waiting to get out. And it might seem like, well, it doesn't even seem like a million, because hands up if you've seen a million cars. I haven't seen a million cars, not in one queue. <laughs> oh, that's car park. That's different. <laughs> but you still wouldn't be able to see a million cars unless you were in a helicopter, possibly. Now, it might seem harmless, but it's still a lie. Because it is a false statement and it does not honour Jesus. A white lie might also be, and many people have been involved in this one, when planning a surprise event for someone, a white lie is sometimes told in order to deceive the one being surprised. It's a white lie, it is not God. <coughs> Um, only a couple of times have I actually been involved in being asked to do this and I made sure I didn't tell a lie. And um, many years ago, um, there was a lady, I can't remember, I think it might have been her 80th birthday, and uh, a party had been arranged at the church for her and it was my job to pick her up. and. Uh, take her out somewhere. And I just simply said, we're going to have to pop into the church for something. I didn't say anything else, uh, but it wasn't a lie. And of course, what we were popping into the church for was her party. Uh, so you, there's ways around, ways around these things. You don't have to deceive and tell a lie. Because to do so is not honouring to Jesus. Lying a white lie can also be an attempt to deflect guilt away from ourselves in a difficult situation. And we're all prone to do this. We may have done or we may have said something that we know that if we admit to it, it'll look bad, it'll make us look bad. And at worst, it could have dramatic consequences. And a little white lie might seem the way out of a difficult and embarrassing situation. However, it is still a false statement and therefore it is a lie. Now the truth of the matter is, since we're talking about falsehood and truth, the truth of the matter is that all of us have been guilty of some form of lying, especially the telling of white lies. Now we need to understand that the Word of God makes no distinction whatsoever between a white lie and a black lie. And the followers of Jesus, you and I, where do we start from? Our basis has to be this, that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Therefore, we are children of the truth. And white lies are not the truth. One of the commandments is this, and you know it well, do not steal or cheat or lie. That's in Leviticus 19 verse 11. God makes no allowances for white lies. God, God's Word also tells us this from Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 22, the Lord hates liars, but is pleased with those who keep their word. And again in Proverbs, we get God's view online, Proverbs chapter 6 and 16 to 19. 
And here we read that there are seven things that the Lord hates and cannot tolerate. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that kill innocent people, a mind that sings up wicked plans, feet that hurry off to do evil, a witness who tells lies one after the other, or who will tell one lie after another, and someone who stirs up trouble amongst friends. How many notice that lying is mentioned twice in these few verses as something that God hates? Therefore, our conclusion must be that Christians should never get involved in any kind of lying, whether it's a white lie, a black lie, exaggeration, embellishment, or whatever. Now, exaggeration may not be considered as lying. However, to exaggerate is to describe something as being greater than it really is, like the fish that got away. And we're all prone to exaggerate. Especially if we're telling a story that involves us. It's an attempt to make things look much better than they really are, or to look much worse than they really are. And you hear it on television. I'll tell you one exaggeration you will hear on television, time without time. And it is when they are advertising a program coming up, and they will say, everybody's looking, watching it. And Rachel and I said, no they're not, they're not for one. <laughs> it's an exaggeration. It's a lie. Because everyone's not watching. Exaggeration is a form of lying. And Christians need to guard against it. And we do that by speaking the plain, simple truth. Now, I'm sure we all do appreciate that there are some very sensitive areas that we have to deal with. Situations when the truth may appear to be more harmful than good. What are we going to do in those circumstances? Well, God gives us the answer in His Word. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, it says this, Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. And you just infer from that, actually to speak a lie means we're actually not going to grow up in the truth of Jesus. But to speak the truth in love, yes we are. Truth must always come enveloped, wrapped in the love that God loves us with. How does he love us? He loves us beyond the description of words. He shows his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love that we have to tell the truth in. Now we all know that unfortunately, all too often, somebody will come and say, I'm going to say this to you in love, and you know full well they're not saying it to you in love. So when you do say something in love, make sure you are saying it in love. It is love, the love of Jesus dwelling in us, flowing out of us, that will actually see that the truth is spoken in the most sensitive of ways, and a way that will mean you stay around to see things work through. You see, it's no good going into a situation and speaking the truth without any regard for the feelings of the person you're speaking to, and then withdraw and leave them to get on with it. That's not love. This would most likely leave that person in the most terrible and awful state. Instead, we need to speak the truth in love. Love that shows sympathy. Love that shows compassion. Love that shows empathy. Love that remains with that person to assist them in dealing with what you've had to share with them. What are we to do? 
Very simple. We must ask the Holy Spirit to direct our thoughts, yeah, and to formulate our words so that we speak the truth in love, not speaking as we would want to speak. I would suggest we all need the following prayer. It comes from Psalm 19 and verse 14. May my words and my thoughts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my refuge and my redeemer. And once again, I would simply say this, and it is to all of us, if we have been in the habit of telling white lies, now's the time to repent of it. And to remember that God makes no distinction between a white lie and a more serious black lie. Therefore, as we repent, it is to ask Jesus to do this, to set a guard over our mouth and to keep watch over the door of our lips. And that also comes from Psalms. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've given us a lot to consider this morning. Things that we might find uncomfortable because they come with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I just want to say that I thank you that you point things out to us that need to be corrected, and you do it through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And your objective is not to condemn us, but to lift us up and to restore us. And just in a few moments of silence here, let's repent of any of the things that we've been considering this morning. We've been involved in it. This is the time to get it right with Jesus. Father, we thank you that you receive us. We thank you that through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, you bring forgiveness to us upon our confession of our sins. And we confess that we have done wrong. We confess that we have been involved in things that we shouldn't have been involved in. We confess that all too often we speak well before we even think about what we say. We thank you that you know our thoughts, even before we know what they are. Therefore, Father, by your Holy Spirit, I pray that for each one of us, you would shape and fashion our thoughts and our words, so that every word is not an idle word, but is a word that brings honour and glory to your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Enjoy tea and coffee.